Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our morning service, whether you're with us in the church here or, or watching at home on YouTube. Great to see so many in the church. Great to see a really good number of families with us this morning. You're all very welcome uh, at our service here. And today is a special day because it's the first day that we're going to be able to join in with singing in the church. So please feel free to sing out um, with all the songs. We've tried to choose ones that are uh, rather straightforward to sing with. Um, so please do join in in the church. But do keep your face coverings on uh, for that, please. Later in the service, Alistair Chalmers, our assistant pastor, is going to bring us God's words, uh, continuing our series in the book of Job. We'll also have a children's talk from Peter Irvin, uh, uh, and we'll pray and read God's words together. Let's begin with a, a word of prayer, just commit ourselves to God now. Our Father, we thank you for what a wonderful privilege it is to be able to meet together as your people, whether here in the building or, or those who are joining at home. We thank you particularly today that we are going to be able to sing the praises of, of the Lord Jesus in the church here. Whatever kind of week we've had, whether it's been a, a relaxing and easy week or whether it's been a stressful and difficult one, we pray that you will help us to be sincere in our worship, to be drawn out in our appreciation of all that you are and all that you have done for us, and to learn from your word, to continue to learn from this very important book of Job uh, and the lessons it has to teach us. Be with Alistair as he brings us your word. So we ask for your presence and your help in all we do. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So we're going to start by singing together Cornerstone, expressing our faith, our confidence in the Lord Jesus.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. For anyone who doesn't know, my name is Peter. I'm the youth pastor here, and I speak, want to speak particularly to the kids. And we're going to play a little game. So, uh, kids, hopefully you can join in with this game. It's very simple. You can join in at home as well. Okay, very simple. All you need to do is do what I say. Okay, so it's a little bit like Simon says, but I'm just going to say it, and everything I say, you have to do. Do you think you can do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, straightforward. Yeah, you ready? Okay, you guys can join in as well. You ready? So do what I say. Okay, so put your arm up. Put your arm down. Crouch down. Stand up. Easy, yeah? Right, okay. So uh, arms out the front. Okay. Uh, arms up high. Uh, crouch down. Stand up. Crouch down. Arms up the, out the front. Arms out the side. Arms behind you. Okay, so you started off going pretty well, and then you kind of slowed down a bit, like you were sort of hesitating. What, what was wrong? You were doing the opposite of what you were saying. I was doing the opposite of what I was saying, wasn't I? And did that make it a little bit harder? Yeah. It did, didn't it? It's hard when people don't do what they say, isn't it? That's hard. That made that game harder, okay? And we can maybe have another go at that game upstairs with everyone. But today, we're learning a bit more about Gideon. If you remember last week, we learned about Gideon and how God sent him to rescue his people. And, and to start with, Gideon was really quite scared, but God reassured him. And with this tiny army, God gave Gideon a big victory. But then after that victory, um, the people asked Gideon to be their king. And Gideon said no, 
And he said the right thing. Gideon said the right thing. He said, no, God should be your king. But then Gideon acted like a king. So he said the right thing, but he didn't really do the right thing. And even though Gideon wasn't perfect, God still used Gideon and gave the people peace. But thankfully, we've got an even better rescuer than that. We've got Jesus who not only said the right thing, but also did the right thing. And he is the ultimate rescuer. And we'll be thinking a little bit about that as we think about the rest of Gideon's story today at Kids Church. So let's just pray just now and thank you. Uh, thank God for Jesus, the, the perfect rescuer. Okay, let's pray. P-R-A-Y. Dear God, we thank you for today. Uh, and we thank you for the story of Gideon. And we thank you that even though he wasn't perfect, he, uh, you were still, still able to use him and you gave uh, the people peace. And I thank you that even though we're not perfect, you are still willing to use us. But we thank you that Jesus was perfect. We thank you that he said the right thing and did the right thing. And that he is the rescuer that we can all trust in. And we thank you for him. Um, and I pray that you would help the kids, particularly in kids' church today, as um, pray that you'd be with them and help them to learn. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter and children. In a few minutes, Pete Campbell is going to come and lead us in our prayer this morning. But before that, just a few notices to let you know about or remind you of. We have a service this evening again at half past six. We're continuing our series in the book of James, which is taken by members of our preachers group. And we're looking forward to hearing Aaron Lockhart bringing us God's word tonight. Tomorrow, as always, on a Monday, we have our online Zoom prayer meeting at eight o'clock. And please join us for that if you're able to. Next week is a new month, so we have a new registration. If you register at the start of each month, remember to do it this week, please. Um, there are details um, either on our website or in our uh, weekly update emails. One thing a little bit different in August, the rules have changed and we're going to be able to sit uh, one metre distance rather than two metres. Now, we're aware that some people may prefer to be two metres distant from others, uh, and we will try to accommodate that, and there'll be an option to show that um, on the registration form if you would like to. But if you could try and fill in the registration form uh, by Tuesday of this week, that would be really helpful. Perhaps this morning I could ask for some help. Um, Very Well Youth Project, which the church has for many years been very involved in, um, has a great problem that there are lots of children who have registered for the primary scripture union groups for next term, more, I think, than ever before. And it would be really good to have some more helpers for that. Now, from Bransfield at the moment, we have people from their 20s through to their 60s who are actively involved in working with the children. Um, so it's not just for young people. But if you think you might be able to help, um, have a word with me or with Bridget um, or with anyone else that you know is involved in very well. It would be great to have more people who are able to be involved in uh, teaching young people the word of God uh, uh, and also in uh, working with them and doing crafts and so on. There are activities at lunchtime and after school uh, in the afternoons. A couple of uh, updates about our church family. Really pleased that Lavinia Duffy has been able to get home from hospital this week. Please continue to remember her uh, and John uh, as he cares for her. And we're very sad this week to learn of the death of Mary Divine's sister, Janet. Mary has been looking after Janet at home for quite a number of months now. Um, please remember her and other family members in your prayers. The funeral service will be this Friday. Now, just let you know what's happening for the next little while in the service so that I don't need to get up again. As I said, Pete is going to come and lead us in prayer in just a few seconds. We're then going to sing again, and while we're singing, the children will leave us for Kids Church. 
Sarah and Callum are then going to bring us our Bible reading for today, and then Alistair Chalmers will bring us God's Word. And I'll come back again at the end of the service. But I will now ask Pete to come and lead us in prayer. Good morning, everyone. Um, what a privilege it is to be here uh, this morning, um, worshiping God again, and uh, we look forward to um, the further reasons of restrictions and being able to uh, meet in greater numbers. Um, Shall we just uh, bow our heads in prayer and just pray for some of the things that are going on in the life of our church and in our world as well? Let's pray together. Our Lord and our great God. We are in awe of your greatness. You made uh, the heavens and the earth and you hold it in your hands. And yet you're not a God who is far away from his people, who made all things and then left us. You love and you care about each one of us and you want to have a relationship with each one of us. We thank you for Jesus, the one who made that possible. He changed everything and through his death and resurrection meant that we could be in a full relationship with you, Lord. He has forever bridged the gap that sin had made and he's reconciled us to you. And for that, we thank you. And Lord, today we are so, we're also so thankful that uh, further easing of restrictions means that we can gather here in church and uh, we can soon gather in bigger numbers and we can soon sing uh, our praises uh, to you as the body of Christ, Lord. That's so um, we're so thankful for that, Lord. Uh, this past year and a half, uh, the church has looked very different for us. And we want to thank you for all the people who have given, uh, you've given gifts in the areas which have helped our church adapt uh, to online meeting. For the, the tech team, live streaming, for stewards and welcome team, for the various groups of people who have met on Zoom to discuss changing government restrictions and then having to make informed decisions based on them for our safety, uh, for all the elders and of course the band. Lord, we maybe do not see or appreciate the vast amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, but you do, Lord. What a joy it is to serve you and we thank you that you've put all these people in our church. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, restrictions are easing, that we are able to um, uh, to meet and there's a, some semblance of normality here in the UK. And we thank you for all the key workers um, here in our church and across the country who have given so much of their time and energy over the past year uh, to the pandemic effort. Lord, uh, would you give them rest um, and let them know your peace and presence in their lives at this time? And we have great joy that the restrictions are easing here. We're able to meet again freely, but the reality is that that's not the case for so many uh, in our church and so many in the world who still cannot meet. Uh, we want to pray this morning for the persecuted church in various areas of the world that struggled to meet as a church even before a pandemic. Uh, Lord, we ask you that you would be with our Christian brothers and sisters in these difficult parts of the world um, hear their cry, Lord, and strengthen them where they are. The past few weeks, uh, we've been thinking about your servant, Job, and the suffering he endured. And we think about those in our church who cannot be with us um, and who are suffering, and those who are here this morning who are suffering too, maybe in silence. Uh, Lord, be with uh, Lavinia as she gets home from hospital. We thank you that you have healed her, that you have uh, brought her back to health and for the, the skills that you gave the doctors and nurses who looked after her. Uh, would you be with her and John as he supports her at this time? And would you be with Mary at this, at this time and, and her family as they mourn the loss of her sister Janet? Lord, draw near to her. Pull her close and the family too that they might know your all-consuming love for them at this time. And I suppose, may that be that, the prayer for, may that prayer be true for all those who are suffering um, in our church and in our country and our world, maybe mourning a loss, a physical or mental ailment, a broken relationship, addiction, however they might be struggling or suffering. 
Lord, you know them. You love them. You care for them. Draw near to them at this time. Wrap them in your love. And as Ian mentioned, we pray for um, projects like the Ferrywell uh, Youth Project uh, in Pilton and Muir House, the other side of our city. Um, Lord, we thank you that their work is uh, continuing, um, that they're seeing growth um, despite all the restrictions. And uh, we ask that uh, should there be people in our church or in our city that, uh, that feel called to that, uh, that area of ministry um, to, uh, to, to love and care for these young people and to show them the gospel truth. Um, Lord, would you raise them up? Would you put a call on their heart to, to go and uh, serve with the, with the Ferrywell Youth Project? And for um, SU, Lord, we want to just pray for SU Scotland at this time um, who have had to adapt so much of their ministry over the past year. Um, we thank you that they're still able to go ahead with various day camps. Um, and although these would be much shorter um, and not what, uh, what many people would want, many of the young people, many of the leaders would want, Lord, I still ask that uh, through all these leaders that are uh, leading at day camps, that the gospel will still be proclaimed and that children will come to know you, Lord, that you love them, that you care for them especially at this time. And so in all these things, we ask knowing that you hear us, you care for us, you answer us, you love us. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask these things. Amen.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sarah, I'm a member here at Brunsfield. Um, so we've got a bit of a longer reading today, we're doing um, three chapters in Job, but what better way to spend our morning than uh, in God's word. Um, so I'm going to be doing the first reading, um, which is from Job uh, chapter 8, um, starting in verse 1. Then Bildad the Shuite replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. Ask the former generation and find out what their ancestors learned, for we were only born yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? Can papyrus go tall where there is no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water? Well, while still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all those who forget God, so perishes the hope of the godless. What they trust in is fragile. What they rely on is a spider's web. They lean on the web, but it gives way. They cling to it, but it does not hold. They are like a well-watered plant in the sunshine, spreading its roots over the garden. It intertwines its roots around a pile of rocks and looks for a place among the stones. But when it is torn from its spot, that place disowns it and says, I never saw you. Surely its life withers away, and from the soil other plants grow. Surely God does not, does not reject the blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be closed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. And continuing in chapter 9, then Job replied, Indeed, I know that this is true, but how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound, his power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mount mountains without their knowing it and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God does not restrain his anger. Even the cohorts of Rahab cowered at his feet. How can I dispute with him? How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me catch my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. If it is a matter of strength, he is mighty. And if, it's a, if it is a matter of justice, who can challenge him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. Although I am blameless, I have no concern for myself. I despise my own life. It is all the same. That is why I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When a scourge brings sudden death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will change my expression and smile. I still dread all my sufferings, for I know you will not hold me innocent. Since I'm already found guilty, why should I struggle in vain? Even if I wash myself with soap and my hands with cleansing powder, you would plunge me into a hustling pit so that even my clothes would detest me. He is not a mere mortal like me that I might answer him, that we might confront each other in court. 
If only there was someone to mediate between us, someone to bring us together, someone to remove God's rod from me so that his terror would frighten me no more. Then I would speak up without fear of him, but as it now stands with me, I cannot. Thanks, guys. My name is Alistair. I'm the assistant here, and I'm going to continue our reading in Job chapter 10. This is Job speaking, and he now turns his attention to God. In Job chapter 10, verse 1, it says, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out of the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty. But tell me what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as a mortal sees? Are your days like those of a mortal and your years like those of a strong man? That you must search out my faults and probe after my sin. Though you know that I am not guilty, and that no one can rescue me from your hand. Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews? You gave me life and showed me kindness and in your providence watched over my spirit. But this is what you concealed in your heart. And I know that this was in your mind. If I, have, if I sinned, you would be watching me and would not let my offense go unpunished. If I am guilty, woe to me. Even if I am innocent, I cannot lift my head for I am full of shame and drowned in my affliction. If I hold my head high, you stalk me like a lion and again display your awesome power against me. You bring new witnesses against me and increase your anger towards me. Your forces come against me wave upon wave. Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. If only I had never come into being or had been carried straight from the womb to the grave. Are not my few days almost over? Turn from me so that I can have a moment's rest before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and utter darkness, to the land of deepest night, of utter darkness and disorder, where even the light is like darkness. That is a very long and difficult passage so let's turn to our great God in prayer and ask for his strength as we focus on it let's pray together father we come to passages like this and we have so many questions we have so many thoughts and lord we ask this morning that you would still our hearts that you would take distractions away from us and lord would you help us focus on your word Father, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It would be really helpful if you have that passage open in front of you as we focus on it this morning. But I wonder if you've ever heard the rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You've probably heard that before. It often gets thrown around uh, on playgrounds at school. Maybe like me, you yourself have even used it when you were called names or teased as a child. But the more experience we have under our belt, the more we go on in life, we realize that words can do more harm than physical attacks. And the scars that they leave, whilst they aren't visible, can be just as damaging. If we are constantly hearing the same harmful words, then there will come a point where we actually start to believe it's true. Maybe you've been told lies repeatedly over the years that you're worthless. 
that you're a waste of space, that you're nothing. Those are lies, but they leave a lasting impression on a person. They leave unseen wounds that hurt and continue to hurt years later. And so a more realistic rhyme is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will hurt forever. That's what we're going to think about this morning in Job chapter 8 through to chapter 10. Job is sitting on the ash heap, remember, with his friends, or so-called friends, all around him. Eliphaz has spoken to him from a kind of philosophical, uber-spiritual approach, saying that he had a vision and he understands Job's suffering. He knows what's going on. And so whilst Eliphaz wasn't nice in what he said to Job in chapters 4 and 5, the way he said it was reasonably nice. It was okay. But this morning we listen into the conversation between Bildad and Job. And Bildad proves that words do hurt. In fact, it's as if Bildad is deliberately trying to inflict more pain on Job. So if Eliphaz's response was a bit more philosophical, Bildad's response is that of a traditionalist who has zero sympathy and offers no comfort to his friend in pain, but instead seems to pour lemon juice on an open wound. So we're going to look at Job 8 to 10 under two headings, words that wound and the words of the wounded. So the first thing we see in this section of Job in chapter 8 are words that wound, words that wound. So Eliphaz was the subtle voice who was measured in his tone to Job. In contrast to that, Bildad is like a wrecking ball. He is a bull in a china shop or a vicious dog who goes right for the jugular. Bildad comes to essentially the same conclusion as Eliphaz, that Job is suffering because of some sin in his life, but his approach is slightly different. And that's why studying these cycles of speeches is really helpful because it gets us thinking through how we understand suffering today and the worldviews that we let influence us. And these speeches tell us how not to speak to a friend in their pain. So Bildad starts, read with me in verse 2. To Job he says, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. And so he sees his friend in agony on an ash pile and basically he says Job snap out of it how long are you going to keep going on like this and then he insults him by saying at the end of verse 2 that he's just full of hot air Bildad is angry he is frustrated at Job's response to Eliphaz and he is impatient see Job has been on that ash heap for months Bildad and his friends have arrived on on the scene about a week or so ago, and Bildad has already lost the rag with Job. He has no desire to comfort him and no desire to sympathize with him. Now, comforters are supposed to be patient, and we are supposed to be in it for the long haul. Don't get me wrong, it is hard to comfort people over the long haul. It isn't easy. As you sit with those who suffer, You need to know that their suffering won't be over in a week. You need to stick it out with them. We need to make the conscious, self-sacrificing decision to walk alongside those who are suffering and to sit with them in their pain. For those of us who are looking on on someone else's suffering, it's really easy to become impatient, isn't it? And to think that the event or the cause of that suffering took place in the past, so surely they should be fine by now. As comforters, we can move on very quickly from things that have happened. But for those who have been affected directly by suffering, it can take time. And those wounds may never actually heal properly. The death of a loved one will always leave a void in someone's life. Past trauma can leave scars that make every single day difficult. 
illnesses can make what seems to be a simple task impossible to us. Our job as a community who are called to care for each other well is to be patient. We need to be in it for the long haul. We cannot be impatient like Bildad and expect people just to get over their suffering. And so Bildad has listened to Job's lament and his outpouring of grief. And his response is he's fed up. He's angry because he thinks that Job's questioning is a sign of unfaithfulness. And so Bildad insults Job out of anger as we, and we see why in verse 3. Bildad says, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? And so Bildad's assessment of God is 100% correct. God is completely just. There is no measure of wavering in him. And this is the difficult thing with Job's friends because some of the things they say are spot on. They get it right. But often, and most of the time, the conclusions that they draw from that are completely wrong. So this is the foundational statement of Bildad's argument. God is completely just. But it only takes the next sentence to see how wrong his conclusion is. Read verse 4 with me. Bildad speaking to Job says, When your children sinned against him, that is God, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. But if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Bildad says very bluntly and without any sense of comfort, Job, your kids are dead because they sinned and if you keep going like this, you're next. Bildad has no idea what's going on. He has no idea that this is Satan's attempt to trick Job into cursing God. Bildad doesn't know that this is God's test to prove the genuineness of Job's faith. Friends, we need to be very, very careful of the words we use and the conclusions that we draw about someone's suffering because our wounds, our words can wound. In verse 4, Bildad says, God is just, Job, that is why your kids died. In verses 5 to 7, he says, turn to God, do good, and he will restore you, very much focusing on material possessions. He has a very black and white worldview. So for Bildad, if you do good, God will reward you. And if you do bad, you will be punished. And we see this worldview all over the place today, don't we? Maybe it's a worldview that we even have ourselves. As Christians, often when things go wrong in our lives, we're tempted to think that God is punishing us for our sins, either past or present. So often we're tempted to think that God is afflicting us because we deserve it. But friends, the problem with that worldview is that it leaves no room for forgiveness. It leaves no room for redemptive suffering. In short, that worldview leaves no room for Jesus Christ. To believe God rewards good and punishes evil in the lives of his people now is simplistic and it is not what the Bible teaches. But it is what many Christians believe today. I've been told that if only I had enough faith and prayed more, I could have healed all of my illnesses. I was in a wheelchair at one point and was told that I would be able to walk Pain-free if only I asked for forgiveness and started living the proper Christian life. I've had friends. Friends who lost a child. And in the middle of that suffering, someone said to them, if only you'd had enough faith and prayed, that child would still be alive. Friends, that is a false gospel. And it puts all the responsibility on us. Weak human beings. And not on the completed work of the ruling and reigning Jesus Christ. Now maybe you've said these things to people before. 
And if you have, I would encourage you to go and ask them for forgiveness and say, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what God is like. Because the only way we can get through this life is because of the hope that God gives us through the gospel, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Suffering is, is often the thing that causes us to come to the end of ourselves. And in that moment, we have to run towards God. The rest of the Bible says suffering is to be expected in life and that it has a purpose. It has a meaning. We may not know what that is. We may never know. But it is not meaningless. And Christians do not suffer now because God is punishing his people. So how has Bildad come to that conclusion? Well, as a traditionalist, he looks to the past. We see that in verse 8 where he says to Job, Ask the former generations and find out what their ancestors learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. So the former generations and their apparent wisdom are the traditions of moral and religious people. Now learning from the past is not a bad thing. But the problem is that Bildad doesn't see that the wisdom of his ancestors is still imperfect. Just because something happened in the past doesn't mean that it is the wisest and best thing for all of time. But also, only looking back, as Bildad is telling Job to do, leaves no room for what God might be doing in the present. Bildad is too busy, feeling like he needs to defend God's honour so he comes up with the right answer that God is just, but with the wrong conclusions. And to drive his point home, Bildad uses three illustrations. Plants in verses 11 to 13, a spider's web in verses 14 and 15, and a shallow rooted plant in verses 16 and 19. Bildad is saying that the wicked are those who put their trust in stuff rather than God. And like a spider's web, it is all fragile and it will collapse. Or that they are like flowers, the wicked are like flowers, that they have the appearance of life, but that their wickedness will lead to death. It's kind of like a bouquet of flowers that you buy from the shop and put on your dining room table. They look nice for a few days, but they've been severed from their roots. And so in a they're actually dead. And it will only take a few days for those signs of death to show themselves. That's like the wicked, Bildad says. And in verse 13, he says to Job, Job, basically, that's, that's you. Everything that has been stripped away from you because you've forgotten God and because you're wicked. And so with blow after blow, Bildad reigns his attack on Job and he ends it in verses 20 to 22 where he says, Surely God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. Bildad says, Job, if, if only you were a good guy. If only you did what was right in front of God, none of this would be happening to you. These are words that wound. Words devoid of grace, with no concept of undeserved suffering, no idea of suffering for God's glory, and no concept of forgiveness. Job's suffering is not as black and white as that. We know that life is not as black as white as that. Even for those who have completely messed up and gone against God every single opportunity they can in their lives, there is still forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ. Let's never be those friends who pour more insults on open wounds without any godly wisdom because it misrepresents God and it hurts our friends. Half the time, the reason people move churches is not because of theological differences, but because of hurtful words of other Christians. Now, we need to sit with those who are in pain. 
We should never assume we know the reason behind their suffering, but we are to point them to the hope that is found in the gospel. The promised presence of God, even in the trenches and midst of great suffering. And we need to be that shoulder for people to cry on in their times of need. Bildad is arrogant and he thought that he knew what was going on. His words were daggers that were plunged into Job's heart, inflicting pain. And because Bildad wasn't suffering, he thought he was wise and he had all the right answers. Friends, please never be a Bildad. Let's not be Bildad. Let's not assume we know everything, but let's be patient with those who suffer. And let us support them well. So Bildad spoke words that wound. And the second thing we see in this passage are the words of the wounded in chapters 9 and 10, the words of the wounded. In the midst of great suffering, we don't always say what we actually think, right? So we may know that something is true, but in that moment of agony, logic seems to just go out the window. The pain is overbearing and the words that leave, often leave our mouths without thinking it through properly is quite normal. What we say isn't always right. And that is the same with Job. In these two chapters and in other parts of the book, Job says things about God that aren't right and aren't true. But at the end of the book, in Job chapter 42, verse 7, God commends Job for having spoken what is right. So how do we handle this apparent contradiction? Because God affirms in both the beginning and the end of the book of Job that he is a genuine believer. So this apparent contradiction can be resolved by understanding that whilst Job knows the truth about God and he believes the truth about God, in the midst of his pain, he doesn't feel it. And so he says wrong things about God. And if you have suffered at all in your life, you know how easy it is to be swept up in the feelings of pain and in the emotions of suffering. We might say that God is unloving, that he has abandoned us, even though that is not true. We might say that God doesn't care because we don't understand what's going on. That's not true. We might even say that God doesn't love us because he is allowing such great suffering to happen in our lives. Friends, that is not true. You are never, ever beyond the love of God. And in those moments of suffering, we need to remember the truth about who God is and the truth that our circumstances, our pain, our suffering, our emotional and mental turmoil, our shame, our guilt, our feelings of despair are in no way, absolutely no way, a representation of how God views us. So let's listen to the words of the wounded. Read chapter 9, verse 2 with me. Job says, Indeed, I know that this is true, but how can mere mortals prove their innocence before God? Though they wished to dispute with him, they could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Job says, I know that God is just. I know that he is right in all that he does. I know that the wicked receive judgment from God. I know that God is perfectly just. But what I don't know, Bildad, is why I'm suffering. And in these two chapters, Job uses courtroom language. He wants to take God to court, basically, to put him on, on the stand and ask his questions. Job wants to make a defense of his own innocence because he sees no sin in his life that deserves such great suffering. But he realizes that he cannot stand before God because God is so mighty. That's what verses 4 to 10 of chapter 9 are all about. Speaking about God, Job says that he is wise in heart and mighty in strength. In verse 4, 
that he can move mountains, verse 5, that he commands the sun in verse 7, that he put the stars in space in verse 9. Job is saying this is how big God is. No one can contend with him. He is so mighty that no amount of words could even scratch the surface of his greatness. He is so wise that all the wise people in the world couldn't even begin to compare to how wise God is. And God is beyond comprehension, Job says in verse 11. Now these verses in any other context would be a wonderful declaration of praise. And yet in this moment to Job, it's a lament. Because he says, he thinks that this mighty, this powerful God has turned against him. Job is saying, how can I even dream of standing before this kind of God and question him? He is too great. And so he sits on the ash heap and as he looks over his life and his suffering, he's crying out and he's asking, why? Why has this great, powerful God turned against me? And Job then wrongly concludes in verses 12 to 21 of chapter 9, that God is unjust. In the midst of his suffering, Job is coming to the wrong conclusions because he doesn't see how his suffering could bring him any good. He knows that he is innocent. And yet he says in verse 20 that even if he is innocent, God would pronounce him guilty anyway. And it brings Job to the point of despair and he despises his life. And the lament continues in chapter 10. Job's friends have basically been telling him to fake it until you make it. Slap a fake smile on your face and get on with life. And so Job says in chapter 10 verse 1, I loathe my very life. Therefore I will give free rein to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. And I say to God, do not declare me guilty. But tell me what charges you have against me. Tell me why. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the works of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Job doesn't see what's going on. He knows that God is just, but his situation is sending him into a spiral of confusion. In verses 8 to 12, Job speaks about how he is one of God's creations. Verse 11, you clothe me with skin and flesh. You have granted me life and steadfast love. Verse 12, so why, why am I suffering? Verses 13 to 17, Job says, if it's because I've sinned and I'm deserving of this agony, reveal it to me. Show me what I have done. Show me your evidence. Bring it to the courtroom and let's chat it out together. Let's sort it out. But he sees no sense and he loathes his life. So he says in verse 18 of chapter 10, Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish that I had died before any eye saw me. If only I had never gone, never come into being, or had been carried straight from the womb to the grave. Are not my few days almost over? Turn away from me so that I can have a moment's joy before I go to the place of no return to the land of gloom and utter darkness. Job says, God, leave me alone. Give me a few minutes of rest before I breathe my last and enter into an eternity of darkness and despair. In his suffering, Job has lost all hope of eternity with God. He can't see the hope for all the despair in his life Job is consumed with the question, why? Friends, have you been there? That place where you're looking at the situation around you and you're consumed by it and you see no hope. Is the question of why eating you alive and all you want to do is scream it out? There is nothing wrong 
with voicing your frustrations. There is nothing wrong with asking the hard questions. They are not a sign of unfaithfulness. They are not a sign of doubting God. It is a sign that you are genuinely wrestling with the situation and you want to understand what God's doing. That is a good thing. But you need to know that the answers may never come. We may never truly understand what is going on. But regardless of the outcome, God never changes. God is good. God is faithful. And in the midst of of suffering, it is important to keep on talking to God. Do not shut him out. Keep on asking for the suffering to be gone. Keep on asking for strength. Keep listen. God is listening. He has not abandoned you. Talking to him in the midst of great pain is important. And to accuse God of being unjust means that we think God owes us a good life. A, good, a life of joy and happiness all the time. And that it's unfair for any kind of suffering to come our way. But the book of Job isn't here to tell us that life is fair. It's here to tell us that even in this extreme suffering, God is good. God is sovereign. God is wise. And God is 100% just. So friends, in your pain, ask the hard questions. But remember that your circumstances do not depict God's love for or approval of you. There is nothing you can do to stop you being his child. Job saw this mighty awesomeness, wisdom and power of God and declares that it is impossible to stand before him. In chapter 9 verse 2 he says, how can a man be in the right before God? In chapter 9, verse 33, he cries out in frustration, if only there was someone to mediate between us. If only there was someone who could bring us together. If only there was one who could plead my cause before this holy God. Brothers and sisters, we have that mediator. We have that person who is perfect, who is righteous, who is fully God and fully man. The only one who can stand before a holy God on our behalf. We have Jesus. We have a mediator who stands before God. And when Satan, the accuser, comes with his list of sins that we commit every single day. And he says, look, look at Alistair God, the greatest sinner of them all. Jesus says, paid for. Jesus says, God, the curse of your righteous wrath that Alistair deserves. was taken on me as I hung on that cross. And so Satan's accusations are muted because Jesus wins. Job thinks that he needs a mediator because in this moment he is not seeing the whole picture. He's standing at the back of the tapestry, seeing all the chaos and all the mess, all the cords leading nowhere and it makes no sense. But God is the good and loving father who stands at the front of the tapestry. He sees the whole picture and he is in control. God is weaving a glorious picture in your life that we don't see yet. We don't fully understand and we may never comprehend it in this life. But we are in the hands of a good God. Jesus is the perfect mediator who, being fully God, stepped in and took the ultimate suffering that we deserve. Friends, this is the mediator that Job wanted. This is the mediator that we have. And in the middle of suffering, in the middle of the open wounds and the agony, in the middle of despair and the emotional, physical, mental pain, Do not forget Jesus Christ who bridged the gap between you and God. Jesus, God in the flesh, stepped into our suffering world, took on suffering himself. 
so that we may be reunited with God and have eternal hope where suffering, sin and death are no more. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is nonsense because words matter. The words we, say, we hear in our suffering matter. The words we say in our suffering matter. But the most important words that you must remember as you're in the trenches in the despair of suffering is the cry of Jesus Christ on the cross as he said, it is finished. That is the comfort that you need in your suffering. That is that there is an end to it all because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand, in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we ask that in the good times and the bad, in the joys and happiness of life and in the sorrows and despair of suffering and turmoil, would you, by your spirit, help us remember the wonderful truths of who you are, and Father, if there is anyone here in the building or listening at home who thinks that their circumstances are a representation of your love for them, Lord, I ask that by the power of the Spirit, you would transform their minds. That you would help them cling to that wonderful truth that Jesus has paid it all. And it is only through him that we can stand boldly and declare that we belong to you, that we are part of your family because of Christ. Father, remind us of those truths in the difficulties of life. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you very much, Alistair. There's a lot there for us to take away and ponder on prayerfully, whether we're going through times of suffering ourselves or, or seeking to support others in their suffering. Pray that God will really speak to us uh, through what he's, Alistair has said this morning uh, and it will make a real difference in our lives. We're going to have one final song and then those who have joined us on YouTube will be leaving us. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Uh, those who are in the building here uh, are going to remember the Lord Jesus together uh, as we take communion. We're going to sing a hymn that um, reminds us of the cross of the Lord Jesus that Alistair finished with, that the price has been paid. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain. Our friends from 20 Schemes again will be leading us in it. If you're in the church, please stand together as we sing. If you're at home, please join in as well. And may God bless you this week. <laughs>